Good morning, I'm in Parliament with John McDonnell, Labour MP and a long time friend of the fire service. And this is We Save People Not Banks and we're going to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the UK. Good morning John. Good morning, you okay? I'm going to have a cup of tea as well. Yeah, we're going to have a cup of tea, you can't, can't go without having a cup of tea. <laughs> so... Okay, you want to talk about austerity and why austerity is taken place. Yeah. Okay, and the sort of implications of it. The situation is this, is that capitalism itself, we live under a system called capitalism. And yeah. even, even in America now, in, in the depth, or right in the heart of the, the um, financial institutions of, of, of capital, and they refer to capitalism. Now, we didn't for a long period of time. No one wants to talk about the economic system and describe it as capitalism. Uh, because as soon as you do, you realise, actually, you, there's a system that's operating not in the interest of most working people. In fact, capitalism is based upon um, the, the drive for profits, profits made out of working people, the hours that they work, the low wages that they have, and inevitably, every if you, you can chart it on a map, virtually every 25 years, capitalism will come into crisis because this drive for this drive for profits forces down wages. Working people then don't have the income to buy the goods that are made under capitalism, and you have a crisis of overproduction and underconsumption. That's one theory of capitalism anyway. And the person who explained how capitalism works best, they now begin to teach him again in our universities, is Karl Marx, because he, he wrote Das Kapital, and it explains exactly that capitalism itself, how exploitative it is of working people, but also how crisis ridden it is. This time round, what happens is, is that when they go into crisis, what happens is they're competing against each other, they're investing all the time to increase their profits. The more they invest, the less profits they make because they're having to pay more to make those profits. The way in which they, they, book, they try and maintain their profits all the time is competing each, each, each other but then also suppressing wages. Now this time round, they came up with another wheeze to keep the boom going, which is borrow money. So more and more people, individuals, got into debt, companies got into debt, countries got into debt. It's a huge, massive borrowing that just to keep the profits going down. Eventually, eventually that burst. Because someone, it just took a few people in the States, the United States, to say, I can't pay my mortgage anymore because I'm not earning enough to pay it. Then it literally was like a domino effect. And many other people said, well, we're in the same boat. They just couldn't afford to service that debt anymore. And the bubble burst. So they basically, they make their profits out of exploiting working people. They try, they, their intensive competition means they compete against each other. They're investing all the time, which means the rate of profit is going down. They try to keep it going by pushing people into borrowing. Eventually, the bubble bursts and the system goes into crisis. And that's exactly what happened this time around. The last major crisis that we had of this sort was in the 1930s. Exactly the same thing, a speculative bubble occurred, eventually burst. In the 1930s, it's interesting, they did the same as what this government did. How do they restore the system? How do they save the system, basically? And what the way the way that they save the system is by trying to restore some sort of profitability to the operations of individual companies and countries as well. And the way that they did that in the 1930s is interesting. They started, first of all, they started cutting wages, they started cutting public expenditure. And when you do that, it actually doesn't restore profitability, it means that actually you get a deeper recession. And that's exactly what happened this time. You go from a recession into a depression. I think they've been quite as clever this time around. And we've gone now, we're into our sixth year of this recession from when the bubble first broke. First. They're now trying to recover from that recession by, well, basically trying to make sure that they reduce wages even further, they make people insecure in work, and at the same time they exploit for harder. They're also trying to start the debt bubble going again, lending people. So what we're seeing at the moment is a slight rise, in, and they're calling it a massive recovery. It isn't, it's a slight rise in, in the income overall. But it's a recovery for a selective group within society, the rich. It's a recovery for the corporations, a recovery for the rich. Most other people, they've suppressed their wages, they've made people insecure at work, they're working insecure hours, zero contracts and all the rest of it. So they're building the recovery by keeping that, if you like, working people on a breadline virtually for many people. And as a result of that, being able to get what profits they can for redistribute to the rich. 
I think we've got most probably facing, despite all what all the media are saying about economic growth and all the rest of it, uh, most working people aren't experiencing any form of recovery. Um, they're finding that um, if you look at what's happened to their wages over the past five years, they've either stagnated or gone, gone backwards. The cost of living, inflation has still been around between 2 and 3%, where well, wage deals at best have been 1% or 0% or even wage cuts. So we're seeing this, this phenomenon of working people actually going through a long period, maybe a decade it looks like there will be in it, but working people are suffering as a result of these measures. But actually, there is a boom reoccurring. It's a boom in the city, and it's a boom for the rich. The bankers' bonuses have started again in the city of London. It's absolutely staggering. The bonuses have started again, but in addition to that, the the dividends that are pouring into into stakeholders' pockets as well, speculators' pockets have started again. And you saw that with the well, you saw that with the sale of Royal Mail. Yeah. They sell it. They sell it at third the price. So they're making two thirds profit, or maybe seventy percent profit. On the, so that's the situation in austerity. This government's role was quite simple. Solve the economic crisis on the backs of working people. Make sure the people that they represent, and it's largely finance capital in the city of London, and the wealthy elite, make sure they're protected and make sure that they can back, back into profitability as rapidly as possible as they can. And that's what they're doing. Mm. So the, to do that, you, you cut wages, you make people insecure at work so they're readily exploitable, introduce things like zero hour contracts, etc. But in addition to that, you cut the social wage. What we call the social wage is basically welfare benefits, health service, education, housing, all those things that you get from the state but you pay in for with, with your taxes. So part of cutting wages is also cutting the social wage. And they've been ruthless at it. More than any other government we've seen since the Second World War. So the situation we're now in, Tory government, restoring the economy in the interests of the rich, making sure that low pay and insecure work is made permanent, because that's the way that they can ma maximise their profits. In addition to that, cutting the social wage on a permanent basis as well. Interesting enough, it's not just about cutting the social wage either. They've come up with new ideas. Privatisation not only cuts the social wage, but at the same time, it enables the welfare state then to be used for profiteering too. Up until now, we've been... We've kept the welfare state safe from exploitation, from privatisation. And the, even Thatcher wasn't prepared to privatise the NHS. It wouldn't go as far as she's done on prison, or this government has done on prisons, probation and all the rest. So they've seen, in addition to cutting the social wage, they've seen the way in which privatisation can be used to restore profits as well. Mm. So one of the big booms in this country at the moment, where the major profits are being made, are in public services that are being privatised. We've seen it with Royal Mail, but the NHS is just as bad. We're seeing the NHS being privatised in the next 18 months. And the profits for the companies that are going into privatisation is absolutely staggering. Let's give you one example in my area. Four doctors got together to take over the um, Harmony, the out-of-hours service, that would normally be run by the NHS. They've just sold that on to a venture capitalist, and the four of them have made 2.5 million each. Unbelievable. Profits. It's outrageous. Yeah. So that's the nature of austerity. It's it's all about using the economic crisis to basically cut wages, cut the social wage, undermine our public services, and privatise as much as possible as they can. It's restoring profitability to the rich. Mm. I mean, a, a couple of things. There. I mean, you talk about the, the working class being suppressed, but the one thing I find is that. Uh, um, probably the biggest lie that's been sold to people is that they're not working class anymore yeah. and it's like it's become a dirty word to be associated with being working class yeah. and um, you know, see so many people that get uh, by month to month living on credit cards and you know they're scraping by yeah, they, keep, they will deem themselves to be middle class yeah. and, and not actually part of that, that social struggle that you, yeah. you, you mentioned yeah. and as far as the NHS goes um, like I said to you before we've, that's been bought for and paid for by our grandparents um, over the last 70 years and for them to then sell it, I just think it's outrageous. And I'm, I'm quite concerned that people are not as concerned as they should be about the risk yeah. of the NHS being sold off. I mean, people that do have um, private health care at the minute are benefiting from the fact that it's supported by the NHS. 
like even the um, the royal baby when when um, Kate Middleton had her baby, it was still on the on the back of a NHS hospital. Yeah. And I remember the press reports at the time were saying it's still got the full weight of the NHS resources if anything goes wrong. And but yeah. when that goes, when that safety net goes, prices will go up. And you know, we've seen it with the the rail rail industries just year on year increases. And yeah. I just there's too many people today that don't remember what it was like to pay for uh, you know the doctors come out and see you and you know like you said it's an opportunity for people to make money yeah. the austerity is and the people that are making it are the rich the only way they get away with it is divide and rule basically the last thing that the Tories want or the, the ruling elite of this country want is people to consider themselves working class because yeah. if people consider themselves working class they then look at actually we're, we're not just in, being picked off individually we're picked off as a class and together, if we come together, we're strong. So all the, I, the battle of ideas, all the media, everything that Tory politicians and others say is to divide up working people, pick them off one by one. They argue that in the private sector their pensions are less good, less, less as good than they are in the public sector. So why should the public sector workers get a decent pension? Well, again, it's all divide and rule. Why should people on benefits live on benefits that are anywhere near a livable wage, so therefore they divide them from working people? Why should the elderly get away with decent, well, they've invested all their lives in taxes and all the rest of it, but why should they get the benefits that they're getting when the young people aren't? So again, it's divide and rule all the time. You divide public sector from private sector workers, you divide unemployed from people who are in work, you divide young people from old, you divide white from black. Exactly all the time it's about divide and rule. And it's to ensure that working people don't understand that they're all part of the same class, we're all part of the same, we have the same struggle, we have the same interests, and it's trying to make sure we never come together again. When we do come together, through our trade unions, or through the political campaigns that we do, the working class in this country can't be beat. And we've demonstrated that, and the best example of that is when Labour were elected after the Second World War. You know, we, we elected a Labour government to introduce the welfare state under Attlee, and there was class solidarity to elect that Labour government and drive through major reforms to construction. You know, the country was in economic crisis then, heavily in debt after the war. We built the welfare state, we built the NHS, we built free education for all our kids right the way up to the university as well. Um, we introduced council housing on a scale we've never seen before, so people have a decent roof over their heads. We introduced trade union rights effectively again, but linked to legal aid and, and rights within the courts as well. And that was as a result of working people realising they had a shared interest, and if they exercised their democratic rights on a basis of as a class solidarity, they could elect the Labour government and transform the life chances of ordinary working people. The Tories learnt the lesson from that. Never let the working class ever again unite in that way. Divide and rule as best they, every plot time they possibly can. And part of it is it part of it is, is ideological, the selling of ideas through the media all the time, you know? And trying to disparage the working class so people just don't want to be part of it anymore. And I think people are waking up to that as much as, 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 as they can really. And part of it is that recognizing time and time again that actually those services that we put together to serve us all are essential if we want a civilised society. And we've seen it time and time again. In this last year, met, the media don't report it very much, but if you think the mobilisations that have taken place, we had ten, we've had tens of thousands of people marching in, in individual areas and campaigns to save their local NHS. Yeah. It came to that close of action emergency. Like Lewisham. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Lewisham was enormous, but actually unreported are demonstrations like that all over the country. You know, large and small, but people saying we've had enough and we want to protect those things that we put in place under the last Labour government, after the, after the Attlee government. If you look at what's happening in terms of the industrial disputes that have taken place, never reported in the media. But it isn't just the FPU, we've had PCS, we've had RMT, we've had NUT, the teachers coming out, we've just had the college lecturers coming out, and this month again we've had two days of strike action from the probation officers who, you know, a hundred year history have been in a strike only three times. It shows you the strength of feeling that there is. And people are beginning to realise there's a common interest. And they're beginning to recognise it's a class interest. They might not call it that, but they're recognising more and more. Actually, to use Cameron's hackneyed phrase, we are all in this together, basically. But we're all in this together to protect ourselves and against them. I, it's interesting, when, when, when you talk to people, um, 
you explain what's going on, and, and all of a sudden people are realising they're coming at us always. You know? People with disabilities at the moment, and I think they're having some of the hardest knocks ever in our history. They've introduced the ATOS system, it was introduced under the last government, but it's been used ruthlessly by this government, where every person on disability living allowance is being reassessed, not on the basis of what their doctor is telling them they yeah. need, but by a private company, and largely by unskilled, but not even medical qualified staff, so they're being kicked off benefits. Unemployed people are being sanctioned, you know, sanctions have gone up from 100,000 a year to over half a million a year, where they're losing benefit overall anything up to six months, some of them anything up to three years, that's the, the way that they're, they're introducing sanctions, and they've introduced it in such a way, young people in particular being hit the hardest. Young people now who turn up at the job centre, they're told they've got to go on voluntary work as part of their search for employment, basically paid for nothing, no wages for them, so the workfare programmes that have been introduced, you go to work, you don't get paid, and then if you don't go to, go, to, go to unpaid work, you then get disqualified from benefit. In the old days, we had a word for that, payment, you know, working for nothing. It was called slavery, and that's what we're going back to. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like we've got more slaves today. I mean, I was at um, a family thing the other day, and uh, one of the young uh, children that was there had to do a project on history, and it was about whether the slave trade was actually as bad as it was made out. Yeah. Because obviously they had a roof over their head, they were fed and watered and stuff. And I told her to um, strap the £2 coin with the 1806 um, slavery thing, uh, abolishment on it, yeah. and actually write the, about whether slavery has been abolished or whether it's just changed, changed its face. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as far as the media goes... The, what go, I mean, the media are so complicit in the scapegoating of uh, in, in people that aren't even here yet, like the immigrants in Romania, they're, they're blaming them for the, the fall of the NHS and not even here. Uh, they scapegoat every single section of society. Uh, how can we make them, how can we hold them to account? What can we do to, yeah. to bring them, in, you know, they're specific, specifically the BBC, paid for by us, yet they're daily, daily attacks on the NHS. They don't report... Um, with unbiased views on what goes on with uh, these different disputes you, you talk about yeah. uh, how can we hold you know an, a, an institution such as the BBC or you know any yeah. of the other media uh, industries to account yeah it's interesting it's part of the di divide and rule strategy that not only do they not report what's actually happening to people or the way people are fighting back they, they perform an incredibly negative role which is as you say targeting and scapegoating individual groups within our society um, at the moment, there's two things we have to do immediately. One is create our own media, if you like. And part of that is recognising that we've got new tools that are available to us, which is the social media. And so, uh, in many ways, it's, it's proven to be more effective than some of the written newspapers and some of the other media that's available. Yeah. In, newspaper circulation is on the decline anyway, rapidly yeah. on the decline. People are looking for other ways in which they get their news and get their information. And most of them are now looking towards the internet. So the social media is quite important to us. In the old days, we never had anything like that. Uh, and we'd be going around, you know, fly posting posters and things like that. We, don't, we can do that now, but actually it's much more effective to start using Twitter, start using Facebook and the new media, internet generally, to get the message out. So in some ways, that's breaking the monopoly of capital that owns most of the media itself. That's the first thing. The second thing, I don't think we should let the traditional media off the hook. And the NUJ has been leading campaigns on this as well, which is making sure that where there is a distorted report, an inaccurate report, or where there's a non-report by some of the traditional media, we take direct action against them. And I'll just give you an example. Even the liberal left newspapers like The Guardian are not affected in many ways. The, um, the IWW union were run their, are running a campaign about the cleaners in London. And they ran a campaign with regard to John Lewis's, and it's still going on. John Lewis is meant to be this mutual where everyone shares in the profits. No, they don't. The cleaners have been private, outsourced to a private company. And the cleaners don't get the London living way. So IWW have been running a campaign. We've been down on pickets at Oxford Circus, etc. Oxford Street at John Lewis's to try and force the company to pay the London living wage. The Guardian covered some of that, one of those reports, and they interviewed one of the shop stewards down there. As a result, that shop steward eventually got sacked on trumped-up charges, basically. 
the Guardian wouldn't cover the story after that. So what the IWW workers did is that they went along to the Guardian offices and occupied them, insisted that they meet the editor and insisted that some story was covered. The editor came down very angry, what are you doing here and all the rest of it. But in the end, once it had been explained to them, um, they said, all right, we'll start looking into the story again. So we've got to start... Those, those companies, those newspapers, those media sources that aren't covering the stories, we've got to start targeting them and taking direct action against them. People with disabilities, DPAC, the disabled um, people against the cuts, the yep. Black Triangle, they weren't getting any coverage of their demonstrations by the BBC. So a couple of weeks ago they went to the BBC headquarters and again in, in, in London and then did a demonstration outside and threatened occupation. And eventually we're getting involved in a dialogue with some of the journalists that sort of takes place. So I think there's two things. One, we use social media, we use our own media, create our own media, and then secondly, where those media and the existing traditional media are letting us down, we target them. The forms of direct action, boycotts, etc. There's one other thing as well, really, which is it's interesting, people are beginning to use word of mouth again. And yeah. People are holding public meetings yeah. and people are turning up well, again. People's Assembly is a good yeah. example of it's that. A yeah. fantastic example. But also in my constituency, now if I convene a meeting, people do turn up. Yeah. If I convene a demonstration, people are beginning to turn up again. It's beginning to change. You can feel that people are frustrated that they're not getting the information. They're going on the internet, but also they want to talk to others about it as well. So I think we've got to build upon some of the traditional forms as well. In the long term, um, look at the NUJ's policy, which is, I think, really interesting. Well, they've been saying, we can have Leveson and get a, you know, on, tackle issues around phone hacking. We might be able to get a breakthrough, the right, get a right of reply in certain newspapers when they have distorted um, news coverage. We might be able to do that. But at the end of the day, we've got to break up the media ownership. We can't allow one individual or one corporation to control so many media sources. And we've got to democratise that. There's arguments around um, having elements of public ownership or public partners within the media so that in, uh, people can set up their own media and be publicly supported by the state. It will still be independent, but you still yeah. have that financial support to set up. A number of journalists that have been laid off from existing papers, uh, particularly in the regions now, are setting up their own cooperatives and setting up their own media, which combines the traditional printed press with the internet and some video recording as well, internet-wise, and even trying to bits of some of the new licenses for regional TV coming out. So I think there's a, there's a lot of exciting things going on, but at the same time, at the end of the day, it does come down to us making sure we have a responsibility on ourselves to communicate with one another. Yeah. That sounds very good. Um, when I was on the picket lines recently with uh, local probation officers and they asked me to speak about what's been going on, and I, I didn't really touch too much about what's going on with the fire service, but I did talk about the need to connect the dots. Yeah. And uh, yeah. There's a lot of um, everyone's fighting at the minute their own individual part of the argument, and it's all underpinned by common themes. And that the important for you know winning and offering a resistance to the tidal wave that's coming against us yeah. is to start connecting the dots and start joining up and you know having that word of mouth stuff that you, that you mentioned. And I think that 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 is the way forward yeah. for you know local issues. What did you think of the people's assembly? People's Assembly. Yeah, I thought it was that really brought good. quite yeah. a lot of people together and a lot of campaigns and every trade union support as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a member of the People's Assembly where I live and um, I've got involved in a lot of campaigns. So yeah. we've had a, a paediatric unit near where I live was uh, basically they defunded it, they removed some doctors and uh, they let it for junior officers, uh, junior doctors basically. Yeah. Um, but then they kept assessing it and said it was a failing department. Yeah. So they decided to close the paediatric unit. So now children have to go, you know, half an hour, forty minutes away, yeah. up to the age of nineteen. Yeah. You know, and I think back to when, you know, when I was a child and I was, you know, playing sports and getting injured every weekend and yeah. thinking about how hard that would have been for my parents to, you know, with two or three kids running around, you know, around the county trying to find a hospital that will take you to set your bones. Yeah. Uh, so we got involved in that and we decided to try and turn back the tide. Uh, library closures as well yeah. so yeah. The, the People's Assembly where I am is quite involved in a lot of those local campaigns and they're yeah. trying to do that that connecting the dots stuff that I, I talk about when I go to different rallies and yeah. you know, try and encourage yeah. people to start joining yeah. up So I think the People's Assembly is a brilliant initiative mm. uh, for, on a large scale it's brought people together we're all working in our own individual groups political parties trade unions and all that but we needed somewhere where we could 
really work together. And also, on, in our movement, there's lots of splits, arguments, and all the rest of it, and the usual stuff, you know. And it, it, it does become, you know, it becomes like the life of Brian, you yeah. know, the pe Palestinian <laughs> people, and that yeah. sort of stuff. But actually, the People's Assembly, almost it's almost as though people have left their guns at the door and they've come and said, OK, we've got to work together. The crisis is so bad, we need to work together. And it's brought new people into it, which is fantastic. So I think it's a good good initiative. But linked to that, we, we've got to have coordinated industrial action as well. Now, the union, we've set up a group called the Trade Union Coordinating Group. They meet on 10 left unions, meet on a regular basis. They're trying to push the TUC into coordinating industrial action better. But at the same time, what they're trying to do is recognise that even if the TUC won't do it, those individual unions can do it. Yeah. And even if it's just, even if people can't exactly all strike on the same day, at least have a programme of action where you can see yeah, that successive a days yeah, or when one finishes and another one starts. Yeah. Yes, because it's all the same message as well, and I think that that's beginning to come to fruition. Now. But it is, it's interesting. You mentioned about the ambulance service, but it's the same with regards to the FBU. People are waking up now to how dangerous this stuff is. You know? In my area, we've lost a pump from Hayes Fire Station. You know? uh, the, the fire station in Hayes is next to the M M4, M25, Heathrow Airport, and some of the major office blocks in West London, as well as some major industry as well. And we lose a fire pump. They're closing the accident emergency down the road at Ealing. They've reprieved it for a few months now to review it again. But even if they continue on, they're still going to cut it dramatically. So that means my local hospital, A&E, at Hillingdon Hospital, will be swamped. So, uh, I went to a meeting the other, other day, a commission that's been undertaken by London Health Emergency, and they went through the timings in traffic of how you get from one um, area of the constituency across to the accident emergency. And you talk, well, it needs us to rain, the traffic seizes up, and you're, yeah. you're in dangerous territory. So people waking up to the fact, like, like the FBU campaign, the, the NHS campaign that's going on, that this is really dangerous stuff we're talking about. And once lost, it's almost impossible to recover. That's why I think people are going to come out in the streets now. The thing we've got to guard against is just a combination of, well, I can't do anything about it, you know, we can't win. Um, that sort of, I don't know, defeatism. Yeah, the apathy. Yeah, the apathy, but also that sort of ingrained defeatism, which is, well, we can never win or anything like that. And you mentioned the Syria vote before. That demonstrated, because a lot of people said, I marched for Iraq and it never did anything. Well, no, we didn't, we didn't prevent Blair going to Iraq, but it did ensure that we never went into Syria. And it was yeah. quite interesting, the number of MPs who mentioned the Iraq campaign when they were debating Syria. And I think the government realised it wouldn't get away with it this time around. So individual campaigns, even if you don't win that particular campaign, it does have a knock-on effect on other campaigns. It builds people's confidence as well, you know. We're in, we're in the heart, you know, all this noise going on around us. There's MPs getting their cups of teas and all that sort of stuff. So we're in the heart of Parliament at the moment. What's happening, I think, is the politics of this place is, is eventually being influenced by what's going on outside, particularly in the run-up to the general election. MPs are realising that people are getting, people are getting bloody angry, really, and they're realising when they go to the next election, people are going to be coming at them, saying, yeah. what did you do when they were closing my local accident emergency? What did you do when you were cutting my local fire station or cutting pumps or screwing the pension for firefighters? You know what I mean? But increasingly now, people are realising in, in here they're going to be facing the general public very, very shortly. And there's a very lot of angry people out there. Even people who are at, in work, uh, no one's happy. Because they're, no, they're, they're not getting a decent wage. They're having the wages screwed screw down. Then they get by energy prices increases or water rate increases. And there's a general feeling of discontent. This is the, what they're suffering. People are laughing all the way to the bank as well. You know, the city bonuses, the city speculators are all happening again, you know. You know, that's why you know we we kind of felt that there wasn't enough of this connecting the dot stuff going on, and that's why kind of we come up with this. We save people, not banks. Yeah, I think you know, it's a brilliant. It's, um, story. Kind of, it was off the back of what was going on in um, uh, Spain with the Spanish firefighters there when they were asked to get involved with the um, people foreclosing on their mortgages yeah. and stuff. Yeah. They just said no, we rescue people, not banks, and yeah. that's kind of kicked off here with some people felt you know that was a, a really strong message mm. and. You know, we've been going around doing political stunts and holding, trying to hold people to account and you know, uh, particularly some of the more vociferous MPs out there at yeah. the minute, yeah. like Ian Duncan Smith, um, yeah. he's, he's someone that, he has uh, the cheek to say you can live on £53 a week, but 
you know, claim the thirty nine pound breakfast on expenses and yeah, yeah. yeah so different what about people. the guy who was just caught heating his stables? Oh, God, I saw that in the news yeah, one, on the paper yesterday. I couldn't believe it. But, yeah, yeah, I, you don't, got, you know, I don't want the horses to go cold, but I don't want to be paying for the no. taxpayers' money. Well, well, somebody said at a meeting I was at yesterday that because um, obviously contribution increases are going up in the fire service pensions, yeah. and um, the Queen, when she opened Parliament this year, she talked about her government was going to help firefighters, um, not firefighters, the public save for their yeah. futures yeah. by providing pensions. Yeah. Well. Conversely, the fire service are now facing being priced out of their pension, and you add that onto like stuff like the the energy bills going up. Yeah. Uh, somebody said that firefighters face being old and cold. Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah. you know, but you also, you know, pay more, pay more, work longer, get less. Mm-hmm. And if you look at, I'm sort of worry you, but if you if you look at the, the the mortality rates for firefighters, large numbers of them don't see much of their pension they don't soon after retirement age mm. and, and some of the research that's been done uh, some of the Scottish research in particular is demonstrating that um, there's a higher incidence of heart attacks and coronary disease among yeah. firefighters as a result of that many of them don't see the full fruition of their pension even though they've paid in over the years and all the rest of it and it's because of the stress of a job it's the physical stress it's also the stress of what you're coping with and what you're dealing with uh, that has to be recognised, and that's why the, that's why retirement age was set as it was. But it wasn't just the physical capacity to do the job. There was a big argument that actually the job has consequences on your health as well. Always has done. You know? It's outrageous. What they, it is outrageous. It's theft, basically. Theft to steal your pension. It, which is well, yeah, it, way, it, it is. It's daylight robbery in yeah. the day, and um, yeah. I think the. Uh, the idea of we save lives not banks is a fantastic thing. It really is. I think it gets the message across completely. And is it, uh, it's interesting that again, it's not it's not reported much. But you know, you've seen on FBU demonstrations and marches and all the rest of it. General public stand at the side of the road and applaud. Yeah. When they see our members going by in uniform, they applaud. So, and so the, the public support out there is immense, really. You know. That's right, the mobilisations, I think, have been so effective. The key thing for us now, though, is that we're going to a general election. We've got to get rid of this government as rapidly as we can. I want a Labour government coming in, but I don't want to go back to new Labour. I think part of this campaign around the People's Assembly and others is making sure we create a climate of opinion in the wider community that any party that wants to get elected has got to, got to abide by an agenda that we set. And then if they get elected, we don't ever allow them to go through what New Labour did in terms of privatisations and cuts and allowing the city to get away with the speculation that they did. So again, whatever part of the movement you're in, or even if you're not in a union, whatever, my view is join it, but whatever part of the movement you're in and whatever political party you're in, it is about creating a sort of that climate of political opinion that no government can ignore us again. And any any party that wants to be elected has to ensure that they abide by some of the principles. That's beginning to have some effect on Labour. Certainly around privatisation it is. Um, new Labour set us up for a lot of these privatisations, but now privatisation has become a bad bad name within the Labour Party itself, so they're beginning to pull back. We've even got commitments of keeping parts of the rail in public ownership as well now, which is a major break. Yeah, that was a big break. Yeah, but it's going to require continued pressure. On rail, um, there's always there's always this kerfuffle about Unite demonstrating outside directors of companies' homes and all this sort of thing. Well, on rail, what Bob Crow did is that they took industrial action, they ran a public relations campaign, but also they did target the people who are making fortunes out of this. Bob's idea was to set up soup kitchens outside directors of the companies who are making a fortune. You know, you've made the wealthy, this is what poor people are going through as a result of what you've done. Yeah. I think that sort of direct action works. It, again, it, it, builds up a, it builds up a climate of opinion um, where we shame those ones who have caused the crisis and at the same time we put pressure on those that are going to the government to abide by the right policies. Well, my, uh, my favourite speech by Martin Luther King was, um, well, it's commonly known as At the Mountaintop. Yeah. But... I think the, the the message in that speech that's lost, you know, much earlier is that talk about direct action and civil disobedience. And he talked about redistributing the pain um, because he, he talked about corporations. Um, he named different corporations that were making profit of, out of um, slaves, basically, as, as it were. 
and he said that actually what we need to do is economically withdraw from those sorts of corporations and take direct action and peaceful civil disobedience. Uh, I think the message is lost because history's kind of been hijacked, I feel, in, in, in the way yeah. it focuses it's on stuff. Yeah, and yeah. you know, so the, yeah. the bit everyone remembers is his last few words about yeah. being at the mountaintop, but yeah. uh, it's a very powerful speech, and yeah. I think you're right there about taking direct action. And yeah, I went to, I went to um, a talk by Angela Davis two weeks ago. Angela Davis was um, one of the radical, black radical 60s activists in the States. And she was linked to the Soledad, Soledad brothers and did a lot of work around um, did a lot of work around the Panthers and others that were in prison. And at one point in the 60s, she was, they, the state thought she was so dangerous, they put her on the top 10 of the wanted list, the most dangerous public enemy number, whatever she was. And now she's a, an academic professor in California, a uh, well-respected scholar, and went through all that period of struggle. But she's done a lot of work on what's happening with regard to prisons and black people, basically, in, in the States. Uh, and, the, and she said, actually, the figures is there's more people, there's more people now in prison in the States at the moment than there ever were under slavery. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Number. And she described the prison industrial complex where all the prisons have been privatised, so it pays to lock more people up. Yeah. The more people they lock up, the more profits they get. And she, and she, she basically said, this is a, how it works in America. In addition to that, when you're locked up in America, you do work, you have to work, and you earn an income, which is a minimal income, hardly anything, but the profit goes to the private company who's, who's got the contract, basically. And when she described it, you realise actually that's the system that's been replicated here. They're privatising our prison, they're privatising probation, and at the same time they're introducing work within the prison system itself. And we've already got evidence now where companies have laid off workers in the wider community where the contract's been taken over by a prison. And it just shows you how ruthless they are, how capitalism is ruthless in supporting profits and how exploitative it is. It? But it's getting that message out. And when she spoke, I thought it was really fascinating because a lot of people in the audience weren't particularly political. They came, they came along because she's a star name, basically. Yeah. But the discussion that went on afterwards, particularly with young people, was absolutely staggering. You know? When she made reference to the states and then others said, well, actually, have you noticed that's what's happening here, incrementally, gradually taking place? Well, people up. And I thought, my God, here's re new recruits here. You know, here's new recruits to whatever form of campaign they want to involve in, whether it's around this issue or whatever. There's new recruits for a new generation coming in. I think that's the way it's going. I'm, I'm always um, optimistic that people uh, once it's explained to them what's going on, that people will take action. And, and I think people, are, human beings are generally just. And they will, they're fair. Um, and you see it from the early childhood, how children share, how yeah. they look after each other. And I think that's the general ethos. It's the economic and social and political system that we've got that make a sort of doggy dog law of the jungle that, that inculcated in people. But I think increasingly now they've seen the crisis, they've seen the system exposed, and people are organising now to see where we go from here. And I think it's about every demonstration that we have, every picket line that we have, we should be talking about the grievance that's why we're there, what grievance we're tackling. But then also we should talk about how it can be changed, what changes can take place. Take the fire service now. What we need to do is make sure in the future the fire service is fully democratised. So that in addition to local councillors serving on fire authorities, representing the local people, but we have firefighters on there as well. So that, you know, who's the expert of all this? Well, the people on the front line, firefighters. So every service we have, we now democratise. Same with the NHS. Bob Crow's argument that RMT and the other rail units are now putting forward is let's not go back to old-fashioned nationalisation. You know, the same old managers telling us what to do. Let's go back to what we, what was envisaged actually in the 20s and, and, and 30s by some of the people like GDH Cole and others who were, um, some describe them as council communists or council socialists. But you, you establish a, uh, the management organisation by including, yes, representatives of the wider community, representatives of the workers, and then, yeah, professional managers. But you bring that together so it's democratically controlled. And in that way, you combine the talents of everybody. So I think now we've got to resist. As we resist, let's talk about the society that we want to create. You know? yeah, what, we're, what we're doing, Seb, Seb uh, is my colleague who, who works in Parliament with me, what we're going to do here 
um, over the next 12 months, basically, is that uh, there's not an awful lot of politics being debated in Parliament, to be frank. Uh, if you go into the parliamentary chamber, um, it's almost a politics-free zone at times. It's that knockabout politics that isn't particularly constructive. It's more theatre than it is politics. Mm. So what we're, we're doing at the moment is organising in Parliament itself, booking as many rooms as we possibly can, and just getting speakers on. People who are expert in a particular subject, whether it's an economist, or whether it's someone who's experienced blacklisting, or something like that. Book a room, get someone to come and talk about that topic, and invite anyone in off the street who wants to come along. Yeah, so good. we surround Parliament, the Parliamentary Chamber, the Commons Chamber, with politics. And you never know, it might infect the Parliamentary Chamber eventually. I think that's a very good initiative, yeah. But just that anyone who wants to raise an issue, we get involved in that way. When I was on the GLC, we opened up County Hall. Now, every night there was something going on, and there were people talking about the housing crisis or the Prevention of Terrorism Act or whatever was going on at the time. The English collective of prostitutes were coming down and saying, look, what was happening to them? We had a group who were saying, we want to communicate better, we want to set up County Radio Station, and it was buzzing. And that eventually influenced the GLC councils themselves, the decision makers. Yeah. So in the next 12 months, what we thought we'd do is turn this into a people's parliament, just letting people speak, getting people to come in, having a proper uh, constructive debate, you know, get, getting people who know their stuff, their policy experts and that sort of thing, to explain, set the scene, but then let others then take that forward and see what we can get that's, in, you know? That's something that sounds really good. I think uh, I know a lot of people that would... You know, that were for that kind of yeah. um, access yeah. and opportunity to debate. Well, if anyone's got any ideas, let us know. Or oh, anyone do. they think to, to talk about. There was a thing in The Guardian yesterday from um, Greg Filer, who's a professor we've been working with over the years, and he's been, the, been doing stuff around the wealth tax for the last couple of years. And he's, he's run it through the Treasury model, really detailed stuff. And again, we're going to invite Greg down just to say this is what a wealth tax will work, how it would work. You know? His argument is that if you just take back on a wealth tax, some of the wealth that they made in the boom years, you'd eradicate the deficit overnight, basically, but you'd give you an investment pool for the long-term future. Ideas like that, I think, we just need to get out there. So if you start the debate off, it's a bit like the tax justice campaign we've been working on for 15 years now. Yeah. You start the debate off, no one listens to you event initially, then they describe you as lunatic or you know, out, off the interplanetary left, someone wants to describe me as on that issue. And then eventually it becomes accepted as reason to argue. Yeah. The way the, the tax justice campaign worked, there was actually combined with direct action. The UK Uncut came along, occupied a number of um, banks and, and other companies that weren't paying their taxes as well. And it became a popular issue. Now we even have George Osborne now to address the issue. Yeah. So I think start the debate off and then the combination of debate, discussion and action brings it to fruition. Right, well, thank you very much, John. It's been a pleasure, and um, well, we'll support you however we can. In you know anything you need from us, we're more than willing to help you out. And thanks for all your support over the years. This is We Say People Not Banks, and John McDonnell, Labour MP for Hayes.